This is After Hours with Amy Lawrence. He played with John Elway in one rings there. Ed McCaffrey was Denver wide receiver. Also with the bird's eye view. And I had a chance to talk to him earlier in the day. We covered everything from Broncos to officiating to what actually is a catch. Plus, he's got this pretty impressive son who's playing college football, too. Can't wait for you to hear this conversation after hours with Amy Lawrence, CBS Sports Radio, CBSSportsRadio.com. I started out by asking him about Brock Osweiler. Two games into his career, but the Broncos' offense looks different. They are now 2-0 and since he took over for an injured Peyton Manning. I asked Ed, from his perspective, what is Brock doing well? Well, you know, Brock Osweiler has all the measurables. He's 6'8", you know, almost 230 pounds. He's very mobile. He's got a strong arm. So he has all the things you're looking for in an NFL quarterback. The thing you don't know uh, about is his decision-making until he gets into a game. That's true for any new quarterback. Now, he's not a rookie. He's been in the league. This is his fourth season now. So he's been preparing for this moment for a long time. But the thing I've been most impressed with was his poise and his pocket presence when under duress. And it's not just making the, the great throw in traffic or throwing the ball with velocity or accurately or down the field. It's been his ability to go through his progressions to find his first, second, or third receiver. But when it's not there, to tuck it and run or to ditch the football. And so many young quarterbacks or first-time starters try to do too much and they try to force the ball in the traffic. But he has done an incredible job of making good decisions. Only one turnover in the last two games, and that was off of a tip pass against Chicago. It was the first game the team hadn't turned the ball over all year. So he's making really good decisions. I think Coach Gary Kubiak is extremely happy with Brock's ability to command the huddle and to lead the team. We're in a space now where the questions are nonstop about Peyton Manning and what happens when he gets healthy. Gary Kubiak is facing them all the time. Fans talking about it, media talking about it. Even people inside the NFL fraternity are talking about it. So if you're Coach Kubiak, Ed, how do you handle this Peyton versus Osweiler situation? Well, there I don't think there's a, a head coach in the NFL better suited to handle a tough decision at the quarterback position than Gary Kubiak. One, he played the game. Um, he's been a starter. He's been a backup. He's coached the game for a really long time. He's dealt with a lot of elite players, um, and he's just a good guy. But he's also a competitor and a head football coach whose job is to do what's best for the football team. I think everybody respects him for that reason. That's why I think he gets along with Peyton Manning. That's why I think he gets along with Brock Osweiler. That's why his players respect him. So, you know, a lot of people talk about what's going to happen. I'm just, I'm in the camp that believes you don't have to worry about it until you have to worry about it. So, you know, he's being honest when he says, we'll deal with that when the time comes. Right now, the most important thing Peyton Manning has to do for him and for his team is to get healthy. The most important thing Brock has to do is continue to prepare every week to be the starting quarterback so that he can do his job to help the team win. Now, Brock and Peyton have been working together. I see him in the locker room. They're talking about plays. They're discussing um, checks and audibles and overcalls. They talk after the game. They're getting along really well, and both of them are super competitive guys. So, you know, I think that's the sign of a great team and also great character in a football player when you root for your competition but compete with them. Uh, at the same time. So Peyton's doing everything he can to get back on the field. Brock's doing everything he can to stay on the field. They're getting along well together. And when the time comes, when Peyton's 100% healthy, you know, that will be a good problem to have. We're spending some time with former NFL wide receiver and Super Bowl champion Ed McCaffrey, who's now part of the Broncos radio broadcast team. It's After Hours with Amy Lawrence, CBS Sports Radio. Big topic around the NFL right now has to do with how defenders can hit defenseless receivers. You used to get slammed going over the middle all the time, Ed, when you played. The rules are designed more and more to protect against head injuries and concussions. But Tom Brady is now campaigning for rules that would prevent defenders from going low in light of the recent hit on Gronkowski's knees, which didn't turn out to be serious. So in your opinion, even with the way the NFL has changed so much, are there enough rules to protect receivers or should there be more rules in place designed to prevent against knee injuries? 
Yeah, it is. I mean, it is such a difficult thing to deal with. When I, when I played, you know, a lot of the onus was on the quarterback. Like some of the throws that you see today, especially the ones across the middle of the field, quarterbacks simply would not make those throws because they knew they'd get the receiver killed because there were no rules. You could hit him in the head. You could go helmet to helmet. You could take him out at the knees. There's no rules regarding what uh, the d- defense could do to an offensive player. Protected, unprotected, it didn't matter. You're just laid out, uh, to the, led to the slaughter. Um, so quarterbacks would protect the receivers. Nowadays, you know, you're not allowed to have helmet to helmet contact. I'm in favor of that. They're trying to increase player safety. I'm in favor of that. Absolutely. Um, it gets difficult when you start making lots of rules because now the defense wonders what they're allowed to do, what they're not allowed to do. And sometimes the defense cries a little bit too much about it, to tell you the truth. But when you see players start to go low at knees, um, you, you realize that that's probably more risky for the offensive player than if they just hit him up high somewhere, as long as it wasn't a deliberate helmet-to-helmet blow. So it, it's a delicate situation. I, I think you know, the league needs to continue to work through it. Um, you know, player safety, again, should be the main concern. But at some point, you can't micromanage every call on every player, you know, bigger receivers typically um, historically will get hit below the waist because in that particular game where Gronkowski got hurt, Darian Stewart went to tackle him up high. He missed a tackle, which is very rare for Darian Stewart and Gronkowski scored a touchdown. So I know what was going through his head. I'm not going to miss another tackle. So I'm just going to take him out at the knees. So I don't have to worry about bringing a big 270 pound tight end down. And he hit him hard for the rest of the game. And so at what point, uh, you know, honestly, this is a fair question. As a quarterback, do you not make a throw to a guy if it's in traffic or he could get his legs taken out? And it's so, it's so difficult to decide how, how to play this. I, you know, I, I don't think there's a perfect answer. Another major topic that comes up week in and week out is officiating, Ed. This is a different day and age where there's replay of every call, every second on the field. Social media is also regurgitating everything that happens during every game. So different than when you played. But as you watch from your perch in the broadcast booth and you see games week in and week out, where do you fall on the officiating in 2015? I would say it's been a down year for officiating. It just has been. And think about it. There's down years for teams. There's down years for leagues. And in my opinion, just from all the games that I've watched, they've struggled more often than than I ever remember them struggling before. I remember when all the hubbub was made about the replacement officials, and I think this year has probably been more scrutiny regarding the officials um, this year uh, than any of the years since the replacement officials (laughs) took over a while back. And – Some of it is not just the call itself. It's the communication between the officials, the replay booth, and the fans, and the the apparent disorganization at times on the field. And so when things are um, delivered in a confusing manner or calls are taken back or wrong calls are made, it's frustrating to the fan because we live in an age today where everyone sees the play. They see it ten times before the officials come back to give us their final decision. So you're not fooling anybody. And, yeah, it's true. 20 years ago, the official could make a call, and everyone's trying to remember, wait a minute, what exactly did I see? Was I right? Did I have a good angle? That's just not the case. Those guys are under a lot of scrutiny because everybody can see what they're seeing. And so I think it makes it a lot more difficult for them. Uh, and they're definitely scrutinized a whole lot more. But this season, for whatever reason, it seems like they've, they've had their struggles. Now it's time for the million-dollar question, Ed. What exactly is a catch in the NFL? You know what's funny is that any six-year-old could go out there and tell you what they think is a catch and what they think is not a catch. And unfortunately, that six-year-old would disagree with a lot of officials. I think any time a receiver catches a football with one hand or two hands and his feet hit the ground, you know, it's pretty much catch. And, you know, I think we, they got so carried away with micromanaging control all the way to the ground after the hit, out of bounds. I mean, Calvin Johnson's one handed catch that he made a couple of years ago where he snagged it with one of, one of the greatest catches in the history of football. 
caught it, and when he came down, he braced himself with the football completely under control, and the football hit the ground, and he didn't get two hands on it, and they said it wasn't a catch. Well, anyone on the planet could tell you he caught the football. You know, what, what are you arguing about? Um, so, in my opinion, if a receiver catches it with two hands, his feet are inbounds, he doesn't, it doesn't get dislodged while he's making the catch, that, that's a catch. And, you know, sometimes I think they fall down in the ground. They, they catch the ball, they take two steps, they fall to the ground, and then it comes out and they say it's not a catch. And, you know, in my opinion, it is a catch. So, if it looks like a catch, if it feels like a catch, then it's a catch. Don't overanalyze it. Let's continue with Ed McCaffrey. I was asking him about his son, and I started out by saying, what's more nerve-wracking? Playing in a game in the NFL at the highest level yourself because he played in Super Bowls or watching his son play? Oh, my gosh. Having kids is the most stressful thing on the planet. You know, when you play, you're in control. You know, you lift weights, you eat right, you get your sleep, you know your plays, you're competing against somebody directly across the ball from you, and you, you feel like you're in control. As a parent, as we all know, you have no control. You just sit, sit back, you love your kids, you give them support, but you have no control over the outcome. So, you know, as somebody who likes to be in control, that's a whole lot more difficult for me, at least. Your son is right there in the Heisman conversation, along with the likes of Derrick Henry. He's averaging nearly 137 rushing yards per game, another 36 yards through the air, and then 80 return yards per game, too. This is a guy who right now is the talk of college football. But how much do you guys talk about football and how much do you give him input about what he's going through right now? Well, you know, we, we talk a little bit about football, but um, the toughest thing for me with Christian is not saying too much. I mean, he has real high football IQ and he loves the game. He's got great coaches. So, and he has great instincts. So I don't want to say anything that's going to mess him up. You know, he, he's, he's got a good thing going. But, you know, we have four boys. They all play football. Um, every week is an adventure. I'm really excited for Christian. He loves his coaches. He loves his teammates. Their team's having a great year. They get to play for the Pac-12 championship this year. Um, and, you know, he's the first to dole out credit to all of his teammates. And, and uh, you know, any individual awards he gets are team awards, really. But um, it's exciting. You know, Reggie Bush was a kid, He uh, a player he really looked up to when he was a kid. And he, you know, just passed his uh, Pac-12 all-purpose yardage mark. And then, uh, you know, Barry Sanders Jr. is a good friend of his on the team. And obviously, Barry Sanders' his dad is arguably the greatest running back of all time. And, you know, he's closing in on his all-purpose record, which has stood since 1988. And uh, he's, he had his poster on his wall when he was a little kid. So when you see your kid kind of getting mentioned in the same realm with his heroes when he was growing up, it, as a parent, it makes you happy. It's like, wow, he's, he's living his dream. So I'm extremely excited about it. And, you know, whether he gets any of these postseason awards or not is besides the point. I feel like he's in a good place. He loves the people that he's working with, and he loves his school, and he's having a lot of fun. So, again, you know, as a parent, that's all you wish for for your kids. Does he wow you when he pulls off some of these amazing feats on the field? Yeah, you know, I I played for 13 years, and, you know, right when I was retiring, I was still staying in. Um, shape because you never know if you're going to change your mind and decide to come back. So I was in pretty good shape and we were playing in the backyard and I remember we were playing and I couldn't catch him and I was getting kind of angry with myself because he was scoring and it was almost like he was looking at me like you should be catching me but you're not Um, and I was getting frustrated but now that he's getting mentioned with you know all these other players and he's having a lot of success um, I don't feel nearly as bad about myself as I used to Um, because he's he's been he's always been pretty good player and and quick and fast, but you never know when they're kids. You know, what does that mean? Will they ever continue to be able to do that as they get older? And, you know, fortunately, it's a real passion his play football, and he's been able to get to a good place. He's loved Stanford, and like I said, his coaches and teammates, and he's had a little success. So I'm happy for him. How are you going to navigate this weekend, then, with the Broncos being in San Diego and the Pac-12 championship happening in Santa Clara on Saturday night? Yeah, well, we have we we have uh, two younger sons who are in high school, and they're playing in their high school state championship game this Saturday as well. So my wife, Lisa, and I, we usually divvy up the responsibilities. One of us will go out to the Pac-12 championship. One will stay home for the high school state championship. And, and again, the toughest uh, challenges that we have are not being able to be there for all of our kids all the time. Yep, mm-hmm. We have four boys, and they always they all play football. They have multiple things going on, so... You know, my son Max is at Duke is going to be able to come out and uh, hopefully go to the Pac-12 championship. 
with either myself or my wife. And so we divvy it up and we, we try to, uh, to be to everything we can get to, but we can't get to everything. Oh, my gosh, what a weekend for your family. Ed McCaffrey, three-time Super Bowl champ, former NFL wide receiver who's now a member of the Broncos broadcast team and a proud dad. You can follow him on Twitter at 87Ed. Great to catch up with you. Thanks so much for the time. Well, I-